On this week's episode of the LA Business Podcast, we talk about a CEO and co-founder who has customers in over 65 countries, and we talk about how they serve 65 countries. It's an app that allows hybrid use of office spaces, which is particularly valuable in today's COVID environment. Let's jump right into this week's episode of the LA Business Podcast. Welcome to the LA Business Podcast, your destination to hear stories of how businesses grow and scale. I'm Robert Brill, CEO of Brill Media and the host of this podcast. Now, let's jump right into this week's interview. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the LA Business Podcast. Today, our guest is Dragos Badea, CEO of Yarooms. And Yarooms is a hybrid work management software allowing companies to digitize offices via an easy-to-use meeting room booking tool. Well, thanks for being with us today, Dragos. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Robert. Tell us a little bit about what Yarooms uh, does. Yeah, so I think you summarized it pretty well. Uh, Yarooms is a SaaS company. We focus on hybrid work enablement. Now, of course, that doesn't... It starts with meeting rooms or it started back in the day, but now it's much more about... Um, helping companies um, offer autonomy to their employees to what scheduling is concerned. So you may uh, book a desk, you want a parking spot for the day, uh, you may want one or two meeting rooms. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, shared assets that uh, companies have, shared physical uh, assets, that since the pandemic started and companies didn't return to a fully remote on-premise uh, work style, uh, need to be partished between uh, different uh, employees. So that's what we uh, do best. So this is really a solution to help um, companies in this new post-COVID world that allows people or companies to share office spaces. So tell us a little bit more that's about right. how this how this works. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, it's fairly simple uh, in in theory. It's just the the sheer uh, complexity of the enterprises themselves that uh, um, and a process change when going from a permanently physical workplace to a hybrid workplace that needs to be changed a bit. So you know, before the pandemic, uh, pretty much everyone was working in office hours. Probably one in ten companies you heard that uh, was practicing what was what is now called hybrid work, but before it was uh, simply you know flexible work or something like this. First lockdowns emerged. Uh, companies needed to find creative solutions to work from home, and then the offices kind of remained empty. So going forward, uh, most of the companies that adapted the situation uh, will not continuing a fully uh, back to the office uh, way. So they kind of, you know, chose the middle uh, path. And what's cool about the middle path is that this actually gives much more autonomy to the employees. So we all know commutes, right? You commute from outside the city to work downtown and you lose a lot of time uh, with the commute. Then uh, you uh, spend a lot of money on gas and so on. So let me uh, just so, let me just tell you that my prior commute uh, before I started this business was between an hour to an hour and a half every day, and it was right. horrendous. Right, exactly. So we don't need that, right? Now we can stay at home and work because we kind of have a, an office at home now. It's almost mandatory. But then you also have the meetings with the team. And if you're in a growing team, if you're in a company where you work collaboratively, you need to work together. You need to have those lunches outside. You need to uh, meet. So I think hybrid work is about mixing these two together, making it, um, making it work, right? Sure. And so uh, my, my point was in the process, companies in the process converting from the old style to the new style of working faced a big challenge in regards to what do we do with the extra space? And we see this, you know, there's a lot of pressure on the real estate uh, industry right now because of it. And it, it's not going to end anytime soon, but, uh, you know, the, uh, they're, they're fighting uh, through it and they're reinventing their services every day. But companies that previously paid a huge uh, bill for real estate for, let's say, for, you know, we have a few floors with a thousand people uh, in uh, downtown uh, Los Angeles, then 
they might get an opportunity now to downsize their offices a bit. And because not all of them, maybe half of them come to the office at a maximum at a peak, right? Post pandemic. So they need a way to manage this shift. Who uh, can sit at this, at this desk? Who uh, are we overbooked for uh, this shared area? Uh, what is the best illuminated meeting room for this kind of uh, uh, for this kind of activity, or uh, you know anything related to what space should I use best because now I don't have one that has my name on it. That's what it basically uh, is uh, in uh, an evening hybrid work. And so, when you go to the marketplace, are you are you trying to reach and are you selling to um, like? corporations or are you selling to companies that manage office space yeah very good question no so we're selling to corporations uh, i mean there's different models here but our primary clients are not the real estate developers or the uh, the managers of the buildings right. Our primary clients are the the corporations themselves that manage the workforce uh, they between them, you know, you, you have a single office building, but you may have five, six different corporations inside. They will have different needs. They need to have different setups, and the property owners are very uh, good at catering to those needs. But uh, the companies themselves need to manage their own process according to their own policies. You know, they may have different work from home policies they may have different it security policies there's there right. all sorts of um yeah complexity around that that uh, they need to think when creating their uh, their workplace strategy and what's and what's the economic impact for a business that uses yarooms like what's the economic benefit how do they realize it what does it look like i think this is a really interesting solution i'm trying to understand the the nuances here yeah it is i mean there's a very uh, clear uh, return on investment case uh, that we make based on a real estate savings alone. So if you, you know, just take a simple equation of uh, 500 people uh, on a 500 uh, people floor, you reduce that floor by half. It's not going to exceed the maximum 200 people limit anyway, because it's, there's not going to be a single day when everybody's coming to the office. And there you have, you know, basically, 50% savings on your real estate bill, which in many companies is the second bill after salaries, the payrolls. Uh, so uh, that, that's a very compelling ROI case that we do. And uh, companies that are looking to downsize their office space include some sort of calculation of uh, the benefits of adopting Yarums in this. Of course, it's not just the it's not just the software solution itself. The project is a bit larger when you're downsizing, but we are a, a very consistent part of it. And the second part, one that's, uh, let's say, not so obvious, but uh, very relevant as well, is the uh, increase in, uh, in productivity that comes because now each employee has an app on their uh, phone that allows them to autonomously you know, access any physical part of the building that they need to. So think, uh, you know, not having to ask for uh, special permissions, keys, or um, any, uh, you know, bureaucratic aspect, except for workflows that are implemented in a one app that everybody has on their phones or on their browsers or in Microsoft Teams, and it's instantly accessible when uh, when they need to uh, to be autonomous. And in the end, they, they, it's more comfortable, right? And right. We, we can make a case for, uh, for time savings that uh, individual employees, it, it adds to, you know, it adds to pretty consistent hundreds of hours in organizations, in large organizations that uh, use their own so, time efficiency alone. So what, how has your experience been over the last two years, you know, as, as you see COVID become, become a worldwide phenomenon, uh, the pandemic, you see massive change. How how's your company fared during this period? Yeah, it's been ups and downs. At first downs, I guess, uh, as any company that catered to uh, physical workplaces, when the first when the first lockdown uh, was announced, 
uh, we had a very niche solution for meeting rooms uh, in our portfolio. And we were on the path for, uh, you know, for offering a more complete workplace management solution, but this was an investment away, right? It was, in, uh, it was on the roadmap. And as the first lockdown emerged, we basically lost 10% of customers in a single week. Right? Really? <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty dramatic. Uh, well, impact. I think I think one of the things that happened, you know, something certainly that happened in our business, we were we were heavily exposed to live entertainment, and I think yeah, the first same, inclination, right? the first inclination is okay. Let's just pause, and then yeah. let's revamp. And then twenty twenty, we had a good year. I mean, we didn't yeah. we 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 made a slight profit. So I mean, we made a slight. We made profit, but we our revenue was higher overall slightly yeah. than it was in 2019, which is amazing considering the challenges of 2020. But I think right. I think the inclination for everyone, most companies, is, okay, like no matter what's going on, let's just stop what we're doing and and assess the situation. It was a tough March and it was a tough April of 2020. So, yeah. but I, but I imagine your solution is particularly valuable for the marketplace that we're now in and and the future, True. like. Like this is this is the exact solution that most companies need that have an office space, right? Like this is the exactly. perfect solution, isn't it? Yeah, and that's how we ended up uh, uh, making it happen in the end, right? Because the the first reaction was, oh, right. So we lost this bunch of clients uh, so fast. Why? And then immediately we started talking to each and every uh, client and prospect we had back then. And we tried to understand how they see the future. Of course, it was April 2020, like you said. Nobody had any idea how the future is going to look like or whether we'll be out of COVID in three months or in seven years, right? So we, uh, by talking to these workplace leaders, we understood how their strategies and how their uh, contingency plans look like and how we could play a role to help them navigate this difficult time. And that's what we did. We enhanced our, we basically doubled down on uh, what we were doing and, and on our plans. And we decided that uh, there's not a better time to invest in developing the product than this year, which is basically dead for a lot of, uh, a lot of industries. And it, it proved to be a very successful bet because in, uh, in July 2020, we actually launched the uh, the more complete hybrid work enablement uh, platform that Yarum sees today. And so we, it, it was the best month in our history uh, as the companies uh, emerged from the first lockdowns. Uh, you know, summer 2020, first companies started going back to the physical office. So uh, yeah, that's, that's how it looked uh, for us back then. And we kind of continued on, on this path now, uh, knowing exactly how, what difference our solution makes to uh, companies that adopt it. Now, I understand you're serving customers in 65 countries. How do these companies and corporations find you? How do you find them? Tell us about the marketing and advertising component of your business. Yeah, so uh, as any business online uh, today, we do uh, our fair share of advertising. We do our fair share of uh, PR. We... um, we have pretty good uh, search engine positioning. So you can find us if you look for uh, different uh, topics related to hybrid work, meeting rooms, desk booking, and so on. Um, And we are also very um, appraised by by clients on platforms like G2. Uh, If you know the the comparison site, G2, Captera, all of these have real reviews from real customers uh, that are using and proved to be using the solution, and we are uh, leaders in this uh, in this cate- in our categories. So this helps a lot when uh, when a potential buyer is informing their decision on uh, vendors to see how we performed with other uh, with other companies, other clients. Now you're based in uh, Bucharest, Romania. How do you yeah. how did you make a decision about the the markets that you want to? Um, be uh, gaining clients in? I'm, I wouldn't say it was a, a conscious decision, but as, a, as an internet startup, you can market yourself to the world immediately, right? Sure. You don't have to be local. You don't have to go through partners. You don't have to have a distribution channel that's very 
um, narrow or precise. So what we did is we simply put out the solution out there and clients started coming. Now, of course, we have most of our clients are from the US because it's a very big market for business in general. I, I would say that the native English speaking countries uh, are uh, our main markets and they kind of grew um, organically. We didn't develop them on on purpose. So, so corporations are finding you and you're able to service them. Uh, what does the what does the next year as you look into 2022 what are where where do you focus your business there's there's so much opportunity i mean the whole world is facing challenges that you can solve for um you have property management companies who are telling everyone that everyone wants to get back to work in the office and the uh, the, they're the only people who believe that um the rest rest of us have 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 the opinion that uh for a lot of people, we don't want to go back in the office. We've been remote completely since twenty you know, since twenty thirteen. Um, yeah. Who wants commutes and 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 all that stuff? So tell us a little bit about how you're approaching twenty twenty two. Yeah, well, for for us as year rooms, twenty twenty two is very, is going to be very important because it's, it is the year where we go where we first start to scale a bit more. I mean, the team. The, the processes, the everything, right? So uh, in 2021, we, uh, we grew uh, consistently. We grew about 120%. And uh, this puts us in an ideal way to uh, accelerate our, gro- our growth a bit. So we're going to raise our first round of investment probably. We're fully bootstrapped by now, by the way. Uh, we expect to have a successful round at the start of the year and accelerate growth with uh, a lot of new hires, especially in the US and the UK. Uh, we're developing uh, sales a lot. We're developing marketing a lot. We're uh, growing product. Product has historically been our uh, strong suit. You know, we were that kind of company that has a very good product, but we don't sell it that well. Uh, that changed over the course of this year. Uh, so yeah, but the 2022 is a... It's going to be a, a fantastic year uh, from what I can see, and it's full of growth. I, I hope, uh, you know, uh, nothing changes to the, only to the better if possible. But right now, sure. I think uh, the, the bullets and the, uh, the bullets there, right? So how, how does an organization who has a great product but not a great sales uh, practice develop a great sales practice? Ah, very good question. Yeah, um, I, I would start by by explaining the. It's it's a bit of a cultural difference, if you will. Right now, from I just learned about you that you know your uh, your folks are uh, have Romanian roots. Uh, I'm Eastern European, uh, and th- there's a difference in culture here because after the uh, fall of communism, we basically had to develop capitalism. We didn't have it, right? I wasn't born in capitalism. Right. So because of that, the, the first businesses that appeared in my country were, um, you know, were not truly innovating businesses. They were uh, workshops. Yeah? Maintaining and, the status quo, but not from government as a private corporation. Exactly. That's exactly. very interesting. Like I, I felt that, but I, I wasn't until you said it. I wasn't able to like really pinpoint what that is. That's really interesting. Yeah, and th- this leads to a to a fundamental cultural difference when you uh, to how sales is approached as a as a process, right? So because of that, because of this condition, I would say most Romanian business builders, or you know, the, at least the ones my age and older than me, than me, are builders first of all and less marketers, less salespeople, right? This is not good for business because if you, if you want to grow, what matters most today, right? You need to grow and you need to grow fast. If you, don't, if you can't grow fast, you know, you're losing time. Well, storytelling. So, I think part of it is also storytelling. Like, like sure. you know, it, it's, it's one thing, even like in, in our business, you know, we're an, we're an ad buying firm and, and, you know, the thing that we're good at is ad buying, but the thing that we need to be that we've invested in that we've become really strong in is storytelling storytelling yeah. for yeah. for the campaigns we run storytelling from a creative standpoint etc like it's so valuable and it doesn't mean it does just because i don't know how to do storytelling particularly well doesn't mean i can't hire for that 
Yeah, exactly. I still don't do it well, but <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Storytelling is a much underrated skill to to develop. But a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> so going back to to how you to how you ramp up sales as a, from from this uh, state of good product but not not really uh, good sales. Yeah. So the the way we did it, at least, uh, it was founder led. So uh, I, you know. Quote under quote, I uh, opened the book, learned the basics. I'm not, I'm a product guy, right? But since I, I was the head behind the product, I needed to be the first person that sells it, right? So even though I'm not as um, charismatic as my colleagues that sell the product that they are, you know, I managed to land those first deals. And uh, we took the, the company to about uh, close to a million by uh, founder-led uh, sales alone, right? Then the next phase for uh, developing sales was to bring in more experienced people that did this before. And, you know, some uh, you would call it a VP of sales now, but we didn't afford at the time a, a full-on VP of sales. So we we hired a fractional VP of sales, uh, mm-hmm. Christy Jones is her name. By the way, I recommend her very uh yeah she she really did a trick on our uh, sales team and you know we've put some process in place it was all about accountability about training the people right about following the right metrics and getting the deals through the uh, through the pipeline right uh, and we're now at the stage where we're hiring our permanent vp of sales or you know but nothing's permanent our uh, full-on VP of sales who will take charge of the uh, full revenue of the company. But sure. these are all stages. And it's different solutions that apply to different stages of a particular company. When you're a startup, you absolutely need to do that first sale yourself to understand your customers. And then you can you can scale it up easily. Right. And, you know, what what's interesting about that process that resonates particularly with me is like you as the founder need to really focus in on uh, CEO and co-founder. You need to really focus in on knowing what needs to happen before you can have someone else within your organization do it. And exactly. we're exactly that's a philosophy that that I also believe in dramatically. We're going to focus so hard on sales in 2022, but. I need to know how to do it. I can't just hire uh, exactly. a, a, a sales veteran from the advertising community here in Los Angeles or anywhere in the United States and be like, here, just generate money out of the sky. No, no I need to know they, the details. Go ahead. Yeah. Exactly. They probably don't know your business. They don't know your partners. They don't right. know a lot of your industry or particularities that you serve in that industry. So, right. you know, no matter how experienced or uh, well fit based on CV, an exec would be, they still, you, you still need to go through a, an arrangement phase or how can I call it? A, a, you know, a ramp up phase where they uh, adapt. And ramp up phase, oh, standard operating procedure, all that stuff. Like it's a, yeah. like that's why it's called a practice, right? Because you're never done becoming better at it. Yeah, exactly. Um, how, how big is your organization right now? How many people? We're 20 right now. 20, and 10? Yeah, 20. 20, fantastic. 20, 20. Yeah, and we're growing to 50, close to 50 in 2022. Very cool, very cool. Um, yeah. So in terms of the culture in Romania, um, you know, you started a global business in, uh, you know, in Romania. I mean, that's that's amazing. How do you serve people in different time zones? Um, how do you handle the cur- cultural differences across different countries i mean holy cow having clients in 65 different countries i mean we you know that that must be there must be some cultural challenges there tell us about that yeah there are but you know challenges are also the the fun part of it so and especially the cultural differences i didn't ever and i would never treat them as a as a challenge but rather as uh, the the interesting part about uh, growing uh, global business uh, one advantage is that we could, you know, being an internet business, we could be global from the start. So we have a core team here in Romania. Of course, most of the product team is here in Romania. But uh, we have sales in the US, for example. Uh, we can have support in uh, Australia. Uh, we we try to distribute our 
uh, team based on the customer's requirements. And uh, this is how uh, we are able to, to serve customers in uh, 65 countries by being, you know, on, uh, being on at least three different time zones. Uh, you know, in, in the simplest form that I can put it. Uh, but then culturally, it's also interesting because we were hiring for this position in the U.S., right, for the first account executive role uh, earlier this year. And um, it was, uh, we, we ran an ad on LinkedIn. And since the moment we published it in 24 hours, we got like 300 applicants, right, which was based on our head of sales' uh, uh, ex- previous experience with American companies was about, seven times more than she would ex- she expected right was she that said, this year or last yeah. year this year this year 2020 right. <laughs> we, we were ramping up our sales team in the us right and we're not a unicorn we're not you know one of those we're not uipath <laughs> we we didn't expect that and uh, the first question she asked in interviews was so, you know, what happened? Why did Yaron speak your interest? And they're like, they're a Romanian company. They're opening their offices here in the U.S. It's amazing. I want to be the first employee in the U.S. And, you know, of course, probably UiPath and successful businesses that started here contribute to that, of course, to the, to the uh, good, well-known name of the country. But it, it's also, uh, it has its advantages. You know, it has its charisma to to. Uh, talk about Dracula and about <laughs> Transylvania, <laughs> Transylvania, <laughs> red wine. I mean, it, this is the cult- cultural spice that we bring in uh, in the mix, right? But then you also have all these other nationalities and all these other uh, members of the team that bring their own. So I guess uh, th- this is what's you know on Twitter. You're not on, of any nationality. You're right. just uh, you're, it's just your thoughts. Th- this is one of the significant changes that our generation will go through in terms of business building. Now, Dragos, have you, global business building. have you always been an entrepreneur? Like tell, tell us about like what, what, when you started this business in 2011, like what, what was the impetus for this business? Now it seems like a foregone conclusion. <laughs> like this is a drum, this is obvious 2011. This wasn't obvious. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh my, no, no, no. So first of all, I was not always an entrepreneur. I'm an engineer by profession, if you couldn't tell uh, so far. Uh, in 2011, I was still an engineer. And the first, uh, let's say, the first version or iteration of Yarum started as more of a joke. I was um, with one of my colleagues, uh, one of my founding members, in fact. Uh, we were visiting a client. And because of a mix-up at the meeting room uh, door, we met with our competition visiting this the same client right and we were like really can so if there could be software for this to avoid this kind of you know it was so unpleasant it was so yeah it was so awkward and we said okay let's look it up let's see if there's software for this and we looked and there was one and uh, there was a SaaS, and there was uh Microsoft Exchange, which nobody afforded, right? No small business could afford Microsoft Exchange. Uh, and we said, yeah, okay, let's let's give it a shot and build something specifically for meeting rooms to avoid double booking of a meeting room and to see the agenda and all that and build it under three weeks. That's how Yarum started initially. It was an in-house project in the uh, software agency that I was working in back then. And so you, ju- you just took the tech and were like, this is going to be the thing yeah except it didn't you know it, it didn't start like that it was well i guess we're not gonna kill this just yet right <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the win when it's not dead <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah now of course i'm joking here we we went through through a few phases along the way and i quickly gained my well, let's say i i was the first uh person the first employee that the yeah, could hire uh, pretty fast from uh, from that uh, initial proof of concept but it was it was a long way and we grew up uh, steadily and bootstrapped and eastern european and whatnot is is romania a good place to hire uh software developers and, and engineers yeah it is i mean we have some of the best minds here you see a lot of companies global companies building engineering uh, centers here 
Um, it's not by chance that, you know, UiPath, Bitdefender, uh, a lot of these companies that started here uh, used Bucharest as their hub. Uh, and that's because we have a very good school for software engineering uh, in, in Bucharest and not only. There's a few cities in the country. But uh, I would say that today the market is as crowded as it's in Los Angeles and other parts of the states in terms of uh, how easy it is to hire a good software engineer. Uh, because there's a lot, a lot of demand and not enough, not enough engineers. Interesting. Yeah. All right, uh, Dragos, how can people find you? Yeah, so they can find us at yarooms.com. So Y-A-R-O-O-M-S.com or simply searching on Google for Yarooms or for uh, me, Dragos Bada. Dragos Bada, CEO and co-founder at Yarooms. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for the invitation, Robert. Thank you for listening to this episode of the LA Business Podcast. If you like what we're doing on this podcast, please consider subscribing on Apple or Google Play, leaving a five-star review, and sharing with your friends. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for a guest you'd like to hear on this podcast, please email me, robert at brillmedia.co. Thank you. Have a fantastic day.